is a very, very thorough handout. It took me two pages. Okay. Sometimes I like to just do one page, but I couldn't do it in one page. But this, this handout will basically, it, it covers every aspect of how to receive your healing. Now, we talk about healing a lot and receiving it in prayer. But this message, and you'll have the handout to go by, it will be step by step. If you follow these steps and you're sincere about it, you'll get any healing that you're looking for because it already belongs to you. We just have to put the pieces together and, and operate in the spiritual laws that God gave us. And so, um, but God has given us amazing promises. You know, the very first promise is if we pray according to his will, he will absolutely grant our request. Let's look at that scripture in 1 John 5, 14 through 15, if you want to follow along. 1 John 5, it would be New King James. Now, a lot of people don't realize this, that if, if you're praying according to his will, he's going he's gonna to answer it. Now, if you're praying that you think your um, neighbor's wife would be better suited for you, then you're not going to get that answered. <laughs> Hopefully nobody prays like that. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I don't know why I said that, but I already said it. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be amazed at what some people pray for. <laughs> Wrong motives, right? <laughs> and so... 1 John 5, verse 14, it says, Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything, doesn't say some things, does it? Anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. That's pretty straightforward, right? And so the next part on here says finding God's will is not difficult because God's word and his will always agree. Or God's will, God's word is God's will. Amen. And so, and his word says, now we're talking about healing primarily, but you can get anything that belongs to you by the, these same steps, right? And his word says, by his stripes, by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. Isaiah 53, uh, 5 says that in 1 Peter 2, 24. But there's a little difference in, 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 in one word in these scriptures. Now, we know that Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet about 700 B.C. He said he, he's prophesying of the coming of Jesus. He says, by his stripes, you are healed. Now, he was looking towards the cross the cross hadn't come yet but the bible says that jesus was the lamb that was slain since since the foundation of the world he has always been the answer right that's how the the jews could get healing and deliverance on the promise of jesus coming but 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 regardless he's saying by his stripes you are healed right and then in first peter 2 24 he says by his stripes you were healed now, that was written in about 62 A.D., so that's after the redemptive work of Christ. So he's looking back at the cross, and he's saying, you were healed, right? And so you can hang on to those scriptures. Remember, so when you pray for healing, you can have confidence because you know it's God's will for you to be healed. Never does he use sickness to teach someone a lesson. Never does he, does he use sickness or, or refuse to heal somebody because he just, he just is in a bad mood or they don't deserve it. No, he's already given it to you. It's already yours if you are a born-again believer. Now it's a matter of receiving it by faith. And that's what this message is about tonight. Do you believe that? Just that very first step is, is so important. I would say probably 80% of the church today, not this church, but church in general, already have missed it on this these two things here by his stripes we were healed it belongs to you and if you ask according to god's will he'll, he'll give you anything that you ask according to his will right so jesus told us how to act on god's word in john 15 7 it says but if you he says if you remain in me and my words remain in you you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted now to abide remain or abide in God's word, it means this, that you meditate, which means to read, ponder, and speak on it, and obey the word. Amen? 
the word of God that you have in your lap, or whichever form it's in, if it's paper or, or, or the, that I gave you, the word of God is worthy of meditation. It's worthy of your time. It's worthy, it's worthy of, of contemplating. And the word meditate also means to mutter or to say it over and over again to yourself. If you're believing for healing, you can go to Isaiah 53 or 1 Peter 224 and you can say that over and over and over again just meditate on it ponder on it and it'll come alive in you because your born again spirit will will be fertile ground for that incorruptible seed of the word of god to get in there and produce a big harvest of faith but you have to do the meditating right you have to put forth the effort it doesn't do any good to um know all the scriptures and don't obey it either Right? We must obey what the Word of God says. And so let's look at uh, Joshua 1.8. This is, this is a good example. When, when uh, Joshua and the Israelites went into the Promised Land, they were, they were going in 40 years after Moses and that crew couldn't go in. And we know that they didn't go in because the Bible says they had an evil heart of unbelief. What caused that evil heart of unbelief? Well, first of all, they kept looking back kept wanting to go back they were very rebellious very uh just very um hard people to they just wouldn't um press into god like he needed them to and they saw the giants if you ain't living if you're not living by faith and you see the giants it's going to steal your heart but if you're living by faith and you see the giant you're going to be like you're going down today right because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world and, and like I said, really, today in, in the New Testament age, in our age, there's no giants out there. We're the giant. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. So that makes me the giant. Amen. I'm a thousand times bigger on the inside than I am on the outside. As Smith Wigglesworth used to say, right? And so are you. You just got to know it. And the devil knows it, too. That's why he lies and deceives, because he doesn't want the Christians knowing who they really are. But look at um, Joshua 1, 8. This is God teaching Joshua how to live by faith. He says, this book of the law, or this word of God, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you'll have good success. So do you want to be prosperous and have good success? Do what he said in in the upper part of this verse, right? He says, the word of God is not to leave your mouth. If you're speaking, you're speaking God's word. You're speaking the answer, not the problem. You're speaking by faith, right? Then it says meditate in it day and night. That takes commitment. That takes dedication. Now, to the natural flesh of a person, that seems, oh, man, that's boring. That takes time. But if you've tasted of the Lord and seen that he's good, that's the most refreshing time of your whole day will be spent in the word of God. Because this world has nothing for you. Amen? But a lot of Christians are just so naive and thinking, oh, all this stuff in the world is more fulfilling and more satisfying. No, it's not. All it does is give you temporary gratification in the flesh. But it leads to nothing, right? So you can train your flesh and your mind and your emotions and all part of you to to love the word. But you got to feed on it and and do it by obedience first. Right. And so, um, yeah, don't let that word depart from your mouth, but meditate in it day and night. And then you got to do what the word says that that's what brings you success. And then it says this aligns your thinking with God's word. Through, through this transformation, Romans 12, 2 says that you will prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So Re- Romans 12, 2 talks about what is good and acceptable and a perfect will of God. And then Joshua 1 talks about making your way prosperous and having good success. They're both saying the same things. Completely different covenants. Both of them are, are surrounded by the word. Meditating. Do not be conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God for your life. It's the same thing God told Joshua in Joshua 1.8. It's the same thing, isn't it? The same thing. The answer has always been, been the same. Now, 
this is this is the good news. So you can either be conformed to the world, or you can either or you can be transformed by the word of God. You can either be uh, conformed to the world, or you can be transformed by the word of God. Which is it for you? What say ye? Transformed, right? Well, good. That means you're going to prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Right? That means you're not going to let this world mold you and shape you and fashion you after itself. And so when it tells you to fear, you're going to fear. When it tells you to jump, you're going to say how high. It's going to, you know, it's just like a, a crazy nonsense out there in this world. Why do you want to be mixed up in that? We don't, do we? But you've got to make a stand. And you've got to say, I'm not letting this world conform me. All that stuff that we've gone through for the last 12 years, all that political correctness and that wokeness and all that stuff, they, they didn't have one effect on what was preached in here. Amen? Amen? Because it's all nonsense. It's all reprobate minds just coming up with stuff because they already refused God and the things of God. Well, we've accepted God. Amen? So let's believe that that political arm of that that mess is broken in Jesus' name. So we can start healing the nation, right? So the next part says, get ready, because you're going to see some changes as you keep the word of God in the forefront of your thinking, not in the back. Sometimes when I go into houses and I see these really nice Bibles sitting on the coffee table, I mean, they're nice looking. I'm wondering, did they dust that off for me, or is it, or is it somebody using that thing? <laughs> I'm not judging. I'm just, you know, just wondering, you know. And uh, Leslie and I were praying for a guy one time. He had uh, cancer and uh, it was pretty bad. But he he wasn't he he we led him to the Lord. But but he just we had a hard time grasp. He had a hard time grasping the necess, necessity of getting that word in him. And um, the first time we went in there, I mean, it was a little scary because. He had this gnarly looking dog. I mean, that thing was a beast. And it's looking at us like, and they're like, it's okay, he don't bite. I'm like, yeah, I hope not. I'm like, <laughs> he didn't bite, but he was protective of his owner. But, you know, we, uh, we prayed with them and talked with them, and then we gave him a copy of Brian Wills' book. And we said, you know, read that book. And... Um, we're going to come back in a week or so, and we're going to talk about the book. And we'll just come back as much as you want and just, you know, just keep ministering to you. So we went back in about a week, and, and I said, well, where's the book? Couldn't find it. Maybe the dog ate it. I don't know. <laughs> Couldn't find it. <laughs> and, and, but my heart sank because I thought, oh, man, in that book is everything you need. But, but you can't make people read the word. You can't, you can't force it on them. You just have to know it for yourself. There's a difference between believing what the word of God says and having true, genuine faith. There's a lot of people who believe what the word of God says, but they, they haven't developed their faith in it. The only way to develop your faith is what we just read. Meditate on the word day and night. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed. Get it in your mind renewing your mind and drop it down in your spirit the words of life once you know it's god's will for you to be well and you're praying according to his will you are right on the right track amen, amen. don't worry about how god's going to do it don't worry about what the doctor said just do what god said for you to do and he'll produce the supernatural do you know that word of god is supernatural it's the incorruptible seed of the word of God that you were born again with. And so you got to get that deep down into your spirit. Amen. And so you read it and you ponder it and you meditate and then you got to obey it too. Now, if you miss it and you don't obey the word, it's not the end of the world. You just got to repent and do better. Right? I mean, if, if you're out there and you get, you get a bad case of the road rage and you start yelling at somebody and hopefully you're not cursing at them. Nobody in here, I don't think. Somebody in there listening later. You know, cursing and just like, rah, and all out of control. Well, you got you to get that under the blood. 
because your flesh rose up. The old man or the old woman, I don't mean call people old, that sounded weird. The old person rose up, right? And you can't let that person take control. Because that person is why we all got in trouble in the first place, right? But what's wrong with having a little bit of conviction? What's wrong with saying, shouldn't have done that? What's wrong with saying, God, I'm sorry? Conviction isn't the same as taking on condemnation now. Condemnation is when people think that God doesn't love them anymore or because they made a mistake, they're not saved, and they're separated from God. That's, that's a lie of the devil. Because Romans 8 says nothing will ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. But it's okay to have a little bit of conviction. It's okay to have a God conscience to say, you know what? That's not the life, that's not the type of person I'm going to be. And I'm going to get in the word. If you struggle with any anger or anything like that, read 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through, uh, 4 through um, 8 or 9. Just read that three times a day. Is God's word God's medicine? Okay, if you go to the doctor and, and you have an infection, he'll give you a prescription of antibiotics, right? So I'm giving you a prescription. You won't have road rage after a while. Somebody will pull out in front of you and be like, oh, praise God anyway. You're not going to steal my joy. <laughs> right? <laughs> You'll be a lot happier. Too much um, violence out there anyway in the world. Where's all that violence come from? It gets in people. They're conformed to the world. It's what the world will do. You're transformed by the word of God. And you don't think like the world does. Amen? So when you keep it in the forefront of your thinking, your ability to hear clearly from the Spirit of God will increase. Do you know the Holy Spirit's always speaking to you? Always, always, always. It's never His, His not speaking. It's whether or not we're hearing Him or not. It's whether or not we're tuning Him out with too much flesh and too much worldliness. He's always speaking. It says, so your faith in what the Bible says, so will your faith increase in what the Bible says about your victory in Jesus. You'll be able to take a firm stand on what his word says. You know, Fred Price was a good minister, a good uh, faith minister. You could probably Google his, his messages. His ministry was called Ever Increasing Faith. Ever Increasing Faith. You all have the ability to believe God's word and to grow. You have the ability to grow in capacity of, of the word that you know and the word that you believe because you were supernaturally gifted that faith when you believed in Jesus. Amen? But you got to grow in it. you gotta, you got to develop it, and you got to train your mind to come in line with it. And then another good faith teacher is Creflo Dollar. He, he says, in all you're getting get understanding and that's from proverbs 4 7 so you can get a lot but are you understanding it amen if, if a preacher or a church takes away god's intent right off the bat his intent for you and put some other motive in there you ain't getting nothing i know ain't's not a good good word but it's it fit in that case you're not getting nothing right you're not getting anything because you got to know God's intent is for you, for you is to pray according to his will. His intent for you is to have confidence. When you pray according to his will, he hears you. That's his intent is for you to understand that his will for you is to be healed and to be delivered and even be prosperous. Poverty is bondage. God doesn't want you in bondage. He wants you set free. I know, I know what it's like to be in debt and in bondage because a long time ago, I, I was in bad shape. And, uh, um, you know, when you have the creditors calling your house and, and they're like, give them my money. Finally, I'm like, you'll get it when you get it, click. <laughs> but I just started doing what the word says. I just started finding out what the bills were. I had credit cards I had no idea I even had. I mean, it was like, a, it just was like, a mess. It was a big hole. And I just started tithing. I had always tithed, but, but I started tithing with faith. I think I was a bucket plunker, like Sister Diane Engel would say all the time. I just throw it in there because something I always did. Never tithe like that. Tithing is, is, is your worship to the Father. So I started worshiping God and started being 
responsible with all my other finances too. It all, it all works together, right? And then honestly, God supernaturally cleared that debt. I haven't been in debt since, and that's been, geez, that's been 25, 26 years ago. I mean, he supernaturally brought me out of the, the depths of the debt collectors, right? <laughs> and, uh, but he did it because I obeyed his word. Amen. I was faithful to believe him and take him at his word. And so I often say if someone says, you know, I don't have much money, I don't, uh, you know, and, and uh, it'd be nice to have a savings account. Ask God for it. Amen. And then do what his word says. And then, you know what, if you want a savings account, why don't you go open one up and, and their savings accounts that what you can put five bucks in there, right? Credit union, you got to have something to put, put it in, right? Take some steps. So I'm going to put five bucks in here. There's my savings account. Yeah, and then the next week, five more. And then before you know it, God blesses you, you'll say, I, I can put 500 in there. You got to move in the right direction, right? Faith keeps people from doing what, what the Word of God, well, fear keeps people from doing what the Word of God says to do. Amen? Don't, don't give in to that fear. It has no place in your life. Amen. And so the next part here says, now that you have taken a stand on the word, believe that you receive those things that you've prayed for. When, when do you believe? When you pray. When you pray, right? Let's look at this. Let's look at that scripture. That's an important scripture. This is the words of Jesus teaching faith again. So now that, you've taken, now that you have taken a stand on the word, you've got to believe those things that you have prayed for. You've got to believe that God heard you and, and that they belong to you and your prayers were answered. Even if you don't see it. Even if you don't feel it. Even if, even if um, all circumstances point the wrong way. If you're standing on the word, when you pray is when you believe. In Jesus' name, right? That's why Brother Hagin says, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I feel. I'm only moved by what the Word of God says. If you have to see it first or, or feel it first, it's not faith. That's why Jesus said to Thomas, he said, Thomas, you believe because you see. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. Amen. And so Mark eleven twenty four 24 says, Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask... We know that means according to his will, right? When you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. It didn't say pray and when you have them, then you can go ahead and believe. No, I'm believing because God's word is also his promises. And he said healing belongs to me. He said whatever I, all these precious promises belong to me. So I'm believing that it's his will. I'm believing that I'm praying perfectly in line with what he wants me to. And I'm receiving it now by faith in Jesus name. And it will manifest in its time. It's not up to me for the manifestation of it. It's up to me to believe God for it. Right. So your confession, speaking scripture and speaking words of faith and hope in God instead of doubt and fear. That's what confession is. And corresponding action, obeying what God tells you to do will make all the difference in the world. And we're not going to look there, but James 2, uh, 14 through 24. Now, if you're looking for like a good Bible study for a while, you can take this handout and you can look all these scriptures up. And you can just, just look it up and go through it all. And guess what? Do it again. And I bet you the second time you get something out of it, you didn't even get the first time. And then if you dare, do it again. Amen? Treat that word of God like a treasure. Like the Bible says, you'll find a treasure. You can't exhaust the knowledge of God's word. And so no matter how things look, or how things feel. Choose to act and speak with the attitude that says, God is in control and he is meeting my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19. Now I hear a lot of people say God's in control. And sometimes if the, if the situation's right, I'll say, well, he is if you put him in control. 
He's not in control just because you say God's in control. A lot of people say that. They don't even know what they're saying. He's in control because I stood on the promises of God's word. And when I prayed, I knew it was his will for me. So I knew he was hearing me. And when I prayed, I believed and I'm standing on that promise. So yes, now God's in control. Then you can say he's in control. Right? That's the only time you can say that he's in control. Because you put him in control. Because you believed and took him at his word. And so to help provide uh, um, in building a biblically based stand on faith for healing, here's five steps based on Hebrews um, 4. Let's look at Hebrews 4 before we go over to these five steps. And we'll look at 14 through 16. And this is going to be the, what we're basing this off of. And so this is one of my favorite scriptures in the Bible. I love it all, but I mean... So if you're going to have a, a faith in you and build this life of faith, you've got to know what Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says. Because if you don't, you're not going to have any reason to believe. Right? This is an open invitation from Jesus. Look at verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So who has a high priest that sympathizes with, with you in all of your, your weaknesses and your infirmities and your, your uh, problems on earth? Who has that high priest? We do. Amen? And he's sympathetic because he loves you. If he died for you, he's sympathetic towards your life here because he wants the best for you. He didn't say, I'm going to die on the cross for you so you can have a mediocre life and get beat down your whole life. No, the first thing he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Go you therefore and go ahead and cast out some devils. There's a whole lot of devils that need cast it out. Amen. And lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Didn't he say that? Jesus is the one who said all things are possible to those that believe. You just got to believe. Right? So look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Oh, that's so nice. Throne of grace. My father loves me. I go to a throne of grace, not a throne of horror. Not a throne of judgment, not a throne of, of get out of my face, <laughs> a throne of grace. Look, look what this says, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. That's what every believer needs to know. Amen. Now, let's look at these um, five steps to receiving from God. And like I said, this will be yours to take with you. And um, you, can get, you can listen to the sermon and follow along again and just pause it and read the scriptures, however you want to do it. Whatever measure you put into this message tonight will be measured back to you. I do know that. Amen? And so, and like I said earlier, the, the Holy Spirit put it in my mind. Having faith in the promises of God, having real faith in there is not the same as believing something's true. Because a lot of people believe here, right? If you ask them a thousand times, and they'll say, yeah, I know that's true. But how do you get it from here to here? That's the longest 18 inches in the world, right there, here to here. How do you get that word from here to here? Meditate, ponder. Just, just meditate means, like I said, to mutter and just go over and over again, get it, get it in your spirit. And renew your mind because Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's faith food, faith seeds that get into the fertile ground of your heart as long as you're humble. And it will produce great things in you. You'll surprise yourself one day. 
You keep meditating on the word and the devil comes after you or somebody needs prayer, you'll be, you'll be praying powerful prayers in the name of Jesus. And this is coming out of you. And you'll be like, at the same time, thinking, man, this is good. Is this me? I remember that first time it happened to me. I mean, but you got to be in, entrenched, engulfed in the word. Amen? When I went to Ramah, um, you know, you're studying, you're studying, you go three classes a day, and then your life is pretty much all the word, all the word. Usually if you're in school, some people worked too, but, but usually it's just, you're just around fired up people. I mean, my goodness, you're at Ramah. Bible Training Center, and everybody's like all hyped, and, and you're just around it all. It's all spiritual for most people. And uh, then um, the Super Bowl was, was my first year, and they wanted to show the, show the Super Bowl on that Sunday night down at the, um, the rec center, the gymnasium. It was on a gigantic big screen. And, and uh, you know, so we're watching the game, and everybody's like, got their favorite team. We're having a good time. And then all of a sudden, it came time for a commercial. If you know anything about commercials on, on, on football games, it was some, uh, some half-naked women trying to sell you beer. <laughs> and honestly, it was a collective gasp in that whole, it was actually a good sound. They were offended. There's no way. Why? Saturated with the word of God. Saturated with the love of God. They're trying to follow God's path for their life. And here comes this devil stuff right in front of, in their face. That was the last commercial they showed. They put it blank for the commercials. That's the way we should all be. Amen? Be that entrenched in the word. So the first thing we do is present the promises. So we go to the word of God and find the scriptures that fit your situation. That's Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So you got to go to the word, right? If you're in need of healing, I gave you two good scriptures. Isaiah 53 and, and um, 1 Peter 2, 24, right? Isaiah 53, um, 5 and 1 Peter 2, 24. And then you go to Mark, Mark 11, 24. You got your scriptures. Go ahead and start standing on them, right? But you got to present to God the promises. So when you go to God in prayer, you got to say, God, your word says this about my situation. I found it. And your word are your promises. And I know it's according to your will, so I know you're hearing, hearing me, and I know I got it. Right? And then you got to ask the Holy Spirit to show you the promises he desires for you to, to apply. And you can just pray and ask him for, for um, wisdom on every area. And, and if, you're, if you're new hearing from the Holy Spirit, you can come talk to me and Leslie, and we'll help point you in. I just gave you two, three good scriptures you can stand on. But there's, there's scriptures for other things, too, you can stand on. If you need a little help, uh, we'll, we'll give you the, the promises, right? Hey, that's what pastors are for. And then pray and worship God. So you presented the promises, and then you got to pray, and you got to worship God, right? It doesn't say pray and start begging. It didn't say pray and start trying to cut a deal with God. A lot of people do that, don't they? God, if you do this for me, I'll, I'll, I'll never curse again. But that's, that don't work, Right? God, if you do this for me, I'll go to church every Sunday whether I like it or not. No. What are you trying to manipulate God for? He's already given it to you. Say what Mr. Zadai used to say, you lughead? I was talking about him last week. Anybody so remember Mr. Zadai? <laughs> no, you big lug. That's what he used to call me, a lug. <laughs> Brother Hagen used to say, God bless their darling little hearts and their stupid little heads. I'm not calling anybody stupid, I'm not, because I'm not that type of person. But it is funny, you know, how, how sometimes people get these concepts of how they're approaching God. No, you got to act like you belong. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 says you got to have some boldness, right? It doesn't say rudeness. It doesn't say arrogance. you got to act like you belong because you do belong. 
And why do you know that you belong in God's presence? Because you know what the blood of Jesus did for you. You know he cleansed you whiter than snow. You're a son or a daughter of the most, daughter of the most high God. You have just as much right there as anybody does. Because that blood washed you clean. You have an invite to go there through the scriptures, right? Like Thanksgiving's coming up, so I'll be going to um, my parents' house and... And, you know, all my kids will be there and families and stuff. And so my job is to bring the mashed potatoes. But I get the, what do I get? Bob Evans. Bob Evans. <laughs> They're just as good as anything else. <laughs> hey, don't knock it till you try it. <laughs> I'm not peeling potatoes. and I, I love my family. But I don't love them that much. <laughs> They're good potatoes. <laughs> try them. And I, I whip them good, though, you know, and put some, I mean, they're nice and creamy. Last time, there wasn't hardly any left. But anyway, <laughs> when I go there, I'll walk right in. If I'm thirsty, I'll just go right over to the refrigerator, get to go in past the living room and, and go in this other room where the big table is and go in there and get a little green refrigerator. And I'll go ahead and get me out a, a Diet Coke or something. Why? I belong. Amen. If I walk in there and say, Mother, may I have a soda? So you're going to say, what's wrong with you, boy? Go get one like you always do, right? <laughs> so that's how you're supposed to approach the throne of God. Like, hey, I belong here because God loves me. None of this did any man make up or anybody else made up this system, but God made a way for you to come boldly to his throne through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus paid a heavy price for you to be able to do that. Amen. Amen? And so, but when you come, you know, you got to humble yourself before the Lord. Let's look at James 4.10. So you can, can you go to the throne room of God boldly, but yet with, with a humbleness too? People get these words mixed up. Sure you can. When I go into my parents' house, like I said, and go get that soda, I have boldness or confidence I belong there, but I have the utmost respect for my parents. I, I, I love that house. I love my family. I love the environment that we're in. I have tremendous respect for it. I, I have humility towards, where, towards that day, right, and, the, and the, those people. And so James 4.10, it says, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Does it say go find a friend to humble you? You got to humble yourself, right? In the sight of the Lord. And you know what? If you spend time in the word and immerse yourself in it, that humility will take care of itself. Because that word's going to overwhelm you and open up your heart and just, just come alive in you. And you're going to realize, oh my goodness, this big, beautiful God loves me unconditionally. He's forgiven me of all my sins. He cares about me. He, he's, just, he's just a big, beautiful God. And, and his tender love and mercy never fails me. Amen? And then you're going to be thinking, man, Jesus did all that stuff for me. They didn't murder him. He laid his life down. They put the crown of thorns on his head for me. They whipped him with 39 stripes on his back by which I'm healed. He, he did that for me. You gotta make it, he did it for me. They, they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross for me. They stuck a spear in his side for me. They spit in his face and plucked his beard out. And, he, and he, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, yet he opened not his mouth. He, his love for me, he covered me with silence. Because it was my sins he was paying for. Love covers with silence, doesn't it? You start reading the word, that's what's going to get in your heart. See, a lot of times when we come to church, we get that word and people are touched by the word. But then when, when you go out and then, you know, by the nighttime and the next day, it fizzles away, right? Why? It's meant to be meditated on and, and pondered. It's meant to be the forefront of your life, not just something you do. Amen? But you got you to gotta humble yourself. And then he will lift you up. You know how many times I use that scripture when people act crazy, for lack of a better word, and, and, and just attack the church? I don't know anybody would ever want to attack a church, but they do. And, and just 
say hurtful, mean things? Well, I'm just like the rest of you guys. Man, I got some good comebacks. I mean, usually my comebacks come at night. I'm thinking, oh, man, I had a good one. I should have said that then. Like delayed. Some people are quick. I'm like more delayed. But sometimes I got a good comeback. And, and, and that scripture comes up at me. No, I'm going to humble myself. Let them be them. They'll answer to God for themselves. I'm going to let God lift me up instead of me trying to lift myself up. Because if I lift myself up and get into that game, they've drugged me into the swamp. And you know what? No argument is worth losing the sensitivity and the relationship with the Holy Spirit that I have. Amen. Not saying the Holy Spirit's going to abandon me, but but you got to have a good heart to commune with him. You got to let because you got to allow him to commune with you. Right. And so nothing, no arguments worth winning for that reason alone. Right. And then um, letter B says, let the lay the promises before him. And we already read that. It says, you know, um, it says that we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. So go ahead and lay it out. Lay it out in front of him. Write it out. Brian Will said when he was here that him and his family started writing out all their prayer requests on a big chalkboard in the kitchen. And he said his one, his youngest daughter, I think, was going into like seventh or eighth grade. That's a, that's a real hard year. You know, you're coming out of middle school and now you're getting in with all a bunch of other kids and you know, you got the mean girls and the bully boys and, you know, and um, and uh, she she was she was having a hard time of of getting bullied in school and getting mistreated. And Brian said, well, we're going to write our petitions down. We're going to ask the Lord. And they prayed over her. They wrote it down that she'd have a great year. And his wor- his wife got a word from the Lord and said something special is going to happen to you this year, something that you don't even expect. And so. She started then, she, she, she wore to school one day these shorts that she made. She, she like, they, like a tie-dye shorts and, and little designs that she made. She cut up jeans and made it. And um, some of the popular girls liked it. They wanted some. And then everybody in the school started putting in, out orders for her. And she became popular that way, but it didn't stop there. Brian says he had these big boxes delivered to her house and these big dryers, and she had her own secret formula to make these jeans like that. He wouldn't, she wouldn't even tell him. She had business all over the world because they prayed. And she said, Dad, I want to go to college, but you're not going to have to pay for it. I can pay for it myself now. Just by praying and writing that out on the chalkboard. And Brian said that, you know, it was so fun to be able to just erase these ones that God handled. God, you handled that one. God, you handled that one. And so that's a family that took prayer seriously, isn't it? And so once again, you got to hear the wisdom and instruction of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's some things in the Bible that's not specifically laid out in the scriptures. Like if, like if you're deciding on whether or not to take a, a new job or, or another job, well, you should pray about it. Amen? You should definitely ask your family and, uh, um, because it might not be the right idea. More money isn't always the right, always the answer, is it? There's this guy, he, he, he took a promotion uh, like four hours from his home and he took his wife the whole way up there and and uh, he didn't even ask her, didn't even pray about it. He should have prayed about it because she got homesick. And his marriage started to tumble, and they ended up um, having a divorce. She went back home. So I don't think that was worth five more dollars an hour or whatever he got, right? And so now does it say in the Bible, in your Bible, take that job? No, you got to ask the Holy Spirit. you got to follow the peace. Amen. And ask your spouse. I wouldn't do anything if the husband and wife didn't agree on it. I wouldn't do it. Amen? Because you're supposed to be a team. And it's not worth it. To hurt your spouse's heart or to cause that division. My dad says, now this is real heavy. You have to be really mature, but I know all of you are mature enough to hear this. He said it's more important to be obedient than it is to be right. 
Everybody wants to be right. I want to be proven right. All I want to do is please the Lord. And I know in 1 Corinthians 13, it says love does not insist on its own way. It's one of the characteristics of God's love. And so we've got to be sensitive like that to the word. Amen? And then it says in number three, it says make your petition. Write your petition out. As your word-based declaration of faith. So we already said that. Write it out. Philippians 4, 6 will tell you that. And then you present it to the high priest of your confession. Jesus. You could check that verse out. Just meditate on that. He, in Hebrews 3, 1, he is the high priest of your confession. That means he's there to carry out whatever it is you're confessing. Whatever it is that lines up with the word of God. Amen. Now, if you're confessing doubt and unbelief, he's not carrying that out. He's the high priest of your God-fearing, God-loving, God-faith promise that you're standing on. You confess that, Jesus will get it done. That's what he's there for. Or some people might say that's what he do. He just does it. Right? So what kind of words are you going to give him to work with? I don't know. To me, it would behoove you to give him some good words to work with. Right? Not these negative, fearful words. And some people say, well, I can't help it. I've just always been a fearful person, a worry person. Well, there's lesson number one. Stop calling yourself that. No, no, no more. I am a God-fearing faith man, a God-fearing faith woman, and I'm going to stay in that word. I'm going to find out what God has for me, and I'm going to stand on it. Because as a believer, the Bible says you have not been given a spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. The spirit of fear. Fear is a spirit. Amen? You don't want that. Stop labeling yourself like that. Right? Right? And verse 4 says, prepare to receive. And then A says, let faith and patience work together in your life. Let's look at that. Look at James 1, verse 3 and 4. You got to let faith and patience have its perfect work. Sometimes people, I don't want to talk about no patience. Well, you better, right? Right? We're talking about godly patience here, not patience like the world sees it. Godly patience is that you're going to continue to praise him, worship him, thank him, and just continue to declare the victory from the time you prayed, from the time that it's manifested. That's the patience. Not like sitting at a doctor's office and it's been an hour. I'm just waiting here and just sitting around doing nothing. Right. So faith and patience. Look at James 1, verse 3. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces what? Now let me just stop there because people get tripped up all along the way because they hear from people that have not studied to show themselves approved. Amen. A workman that rightly divides the word of truth. It says knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. God isn't the source of any of those testings comes from the devil amen he's the tester tempter and trier of the human race so don't think that god's putting you through something to to give you patience no you got to get back to the right intent of god for you to stay on track because just that little thought process will throw you off you got to know that there's a devil out there jesus said he steals kills and destroys the Bible says he roams around like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour. You've got to resist him steadfast in faith, right? Look at verse 4. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So you've got to let patience work in there. And I'll give you me an example here, about ready to close. When I, when I became a pastor, I mean, I had a lot of work to do. I mean, I had it all in here, but I had a lot of soulish things and a lot of things I just had to work through. And, um, but in my heart and in my mind, I could see who it is that I could be. 
but it didn't happen overnight because I had to I had to keep working at it and keep functioning and trusting God and then over time over just I just kept being faithful over time he started developing me and putting things in me that I knew were in there just needed to put some time in to get it out because sometimes you, you don't get things overnight there's something to be said for experience amen, amen. And so now I've been at it for 21 years, and now I'm more closer to that person that I saw way back in the beginning. But I thought I was going to get it after my third sermon. But I will tell you this, I've never stood up here that the Holy Spirit wasn't with me. And the word, wasn't, the word was going out in power. I'm just talking about development, me personally developing in every way. Being a pastor is more, standing up, more than standing up and giving a sermon. That's like 5% of it. There's a whole lot of stuff in between, right? But it takes patience. But if you're in it for the long haul, then just be patient. It'll come, right? I think I was telling um, Brother Ron there today that when I worked for the tree service, I was a foreman, ran my own crew, and um, did that for like 15 years before I went to Bible school. Before that, I was, in, I was in the military. Before that, I was in, in, in college. But, you know, after about three years, you think you pretty much know what's, what you're doing, right? My dad comes out on a job one day, and he says, you know, it takes about seven years for someone to be a good foreman. I'm thinking, seven years? I've been out of three years, and I already know this stuff. <laughs> and then the very next day, I cut myself in the leg with the 028 chainsaw right across my kneecap, right in the meat. Didn't hit the bone, or I, I don't know what would happen. And then God bless him, Don Engel, who's a wonderful man, dad's right-hand man for years. Um, he drove me to the hospital from on top of McCallsburg Mountain. And, and Don was known as a slow driver. In fact, you get a little upset with him, because you know when you're driving on like a little bit of a convoy, you've got to keep up. So, you, so if there's a red light and it's, it starts to turn yellow, well, you've got to step on it a little bit and get through. <laughs> Don't be poking there and say, oh, red light. No, you got to move. Because then everybody's got to pull off and wait for you and all this stuff. But on this day, he drove like a wild man. <laughs> Take me to the Jennifer Hospital. And I'm like, Don, it's okay, I'm fine. You don't have to go that fast. We're like, Shh. you're coming down off that mountain. There's some steep banks. I'm like, I'm okay. <laughs> but... When, when, I, when, when I got seven years in, when I got seven years in as a foreman, you know what I said? I didn't even know what I was doing back there four years ago. Go figure, Dad was right again. He's usually right. He usually is. And I appreciate him for that. Because he, he's not, he's, when he tells you things, he's not worried about hurting your feelings so much. He'll just tell you what you need to hear. And then it's up to you how you take it. <laughs> you know, you just got to know with my dad that he loves you and he loves you the way he loves you. And don't get so sensitive. <laughs> and so I learned that through life. <laughs> right. And so. But it does take patience, doesn't it? And then the last step, number five, praise God for the manifestation of victory. It says, let every request be accompanied by your thanksgiving to the Lord for his faithfulness to his fullness of his, to, to fulfill his promises. And then he's got some scriptures there. And so the last um, little part here, Psalms 107, 20 tells us that God sent his word and healed them. According to Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, and 1 Peter 2, 24, healing is a fact as far as God is concerned. That's a fact, right? It belongs to us. Because healing was in the atonement. What was the atonement? The sacrifice on the cross. Atonement means he, he paid the price. Redemption, right? He paid the price for the sins and the sickness and the disease of the whole world. Amen? Amen. Healing was in that. So our confession of the word of God calls for healing, which is already ours, but is not in manifestation yet in our bodies. That's why Abraham believed in a God that calls things that are not as though they were. 
He spoke the promise into his, into his body, now a hundred, and Sarah, 90, in the deadness of her womb, he spoke the promise of having the child. And the Bible says as he did that, he grew stronger in faith. Amen? But don't turn there, but I did want to read to you. I got it on my paper here. 2 Corinthians 1.20. It's on your paper. It says, For all the promises of God in him, or in Christ, are yes. And in him, amen. To the glory of God through us. He's already said yes. And amen. So be it, right? In Christ, all the promises that you have according to the word of God in Christ, being in Christ, he's already said yes to him. Amen? So why do people go to God and beg and ask over and over and over again for things and plead? You don't have to do that. Follow this, these instructions. You find the promises and you go with boldness and you pray the word and you stand on the word and it's going to come about. Amen? Because God cannot fail. He will not fail you. But you got to put your time in. And like I said in the beginning, the flesh likes what the flesh likes, and the flesh likes its own routines. Don't give your flesh one inch. You get the spiritual things in you, and then after a while, even your own flesh will say, hey, let's do the spiritual things. Because it would have tasted of the Lord and seen that it's good. Amen? It brings you pure joy. How do you get the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, all these wonderful fruits of the Spirit. How do you get them? Sowing to the Spirit. You don't get them in the world. You really, the world is looking for the fruit of the Spirit. They don't call it that. Are they looking for love? Are they looking for joy? Are they looking for peace and tranquility and quietness for their minds and they're looking for it all, but they're looking in the wrong places. That's fruit of the Holy Spirit that's in you. That stuff comes from in here, not on the outside coming in. It comes from the inside and works its way on the outside because the kingdom of God is in you. Amen? That's all I have. Would you rise, please? Thank you for coming. Keep praying, right? Keep praying and believing. Let's pray. Father, we come to the name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for everyone that came. I thank you, Lord, for being with them and blessing them and walking with them in victory in every step of the way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.